All right, let's go ahead and get started. Good morning, everyone. I'm Ria Aguinaldo with the Economic Development Department. I'm a small business engagement specialist and I manage the property assessment districts at our department, which includes the maintenance assessment district and the property and business improvement program. I wanted to kick it off with a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. First off, this meeting is being recorded and a copy of the PowerPoint slides will be shared with participants. After the webinar, you'll receive an email with a copy of the recording and the slide deck, as well as um, contact information of the presenters and some resources that we cover during the, sec the session. Secondly, please write your answers or your questions, excuse me, into the chat box. We're going to be taking Q&A at the end after the presentations. Also, as a reminder, just go ahead and keep yourselves on mute. And with that, we can go ahead and get started. I'll go ahead and turn it over to Sean Carafin on our team. Sean, take it away. Thanks, Ria. Appreciate it. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, thanks for joining the webinar. I'm Sean Carafin, Program Manager with the Economic Development Department. Um, Today we're uh, talking about best practices, power washing, water conservation geared for our maintenance assessment district managers. Um, we have several members of our team here um, with the City of San Diego's Economic Development Department. Um, you heard from Ria already, Michelle Munoz is on the line. I um, see several others. So thank you all for being here, Alex Vitti. Angel, thank you. Um, we also, uh, we have several others joining and we're gonna get to introductions for all of them very soon. Um, we have, before we dive in, uh, it would be great to see who's joining us this morning. Um, so if you could drop your name into the chat box, my phones are blowing up, my apologies. Um, if you could drop your name into the chat, um, I'd appreciate it, along with the name of your organization or company um, that you're associated with. Um, if you're associated with a particular maintenance assessment district, please include that as well. Um, see a bunch of names I recognize over here. So thank you, Jim, as always. Uh, appreciate you. Um, Denny, Scott, thanks all. Uh, Brian, thank you all for being here. Really appreciate it. Um, we have an agenda that we're going to get to next. We'll, we'll, um, we'll move into presentations uh, shortly. We're going to ask each presenter to introduce themselves um, during their portion of the presentation and hand it off um, to the next presenter. So first, we're going to um, head over to our stormwater department, and that's Victoria Falkers. All right, good morning. Thank you so much for, for that. Um, my name is Vicki Calkerts. I'm from the stormwater department. And today I'm gonna be, be discussing power washing, but only from a stormwater perspective. So specifically stormwater regulations, proper best management practices to prevent runoff and also what not to do. Next slide, please. So I wanted to start out with the very basics of stormwater. I know a lot of people are not aware that stormwater is not treated at wastewater treatment plants. It's discharged, discharged from our streets, rooftops, driveways, into the nearest storm drain outfall that ultimately ends up into the ocean. And you can see on this, um, on this graphic here how that works, how the water comes off our streets, goes into the closest river, down into the ocean, the bay, wherever, um, but it does not get treated. It just runs right off. So another thing I wanted to point out is that the storm drain system includes a lot more area than you might think. So it includes a curb gutter, street, alley, inlet, pipes, channels, brow ditches, all of those things are part, part of the storm drain system, which is why we don't allow any runoff to come into the gutter. You might notice that sometimes there's like an inlet three blocks away. So that gutter is actually part of the drain system. It is designed to carry water from wherever that area is all the way to the inlet. So it's still, counts as part of the storm, rain, storm drain system, excuse me. And so any discharges to the gutter, street, alley, anything like that are illegal, even if they don't quite make it all the way to the inlet, it still is part of that system. Next slide, please. So stormwater regulations, I wanna talk a little bit about them. I'm not gonna get into all the details. Our permit is like several hundred pages long. I'm just gonna to touch on the regulations that guide what we're here to talk about today. So the city and other local jurisdictions are covered under this municipal separate storm sewer system. 
known as our MS4 permit, and it guides and regulates how we handle stormwater that leaves our city system and enters any river, streams, bay, and ultimately the ocean. So the San Diego Regional Water Quality Control Board has jurisdiction over these waters and why we are not allowed to discharge into them and why we really have to um, be careful what pollutants go out into the water. Nobody wants to swim in any kind of you know, discharge, no um, power washing, washing discharge. So we're really highly regulated um, when it comes to that. So the MS4 permit also includes really specific regulations regarding um, what's allowed and what's not allowed, and particularly in dry weather. It also requires us and other jurisdictions to pass a municipal code that prohibits these discharges. It requires minimum best management practices for any potentially pollutant, pollution generating activity, which includes um, power washing. And we also have to have enforcement procedures such as escalating enforcement, which I'll talk about in just a little bit. Uh, next slide, please. So there's minimum best, pra best management practices for many activities, but today we're just talking about power washing. So this is actually a snippet of what's attached to our municipal, municipal code and what's required for wash water discharges. I know it's a little hard to see because it's kind of small, but um, you can see that it says all process and wash water must be contained, captured, or reused and properly disposed of. And also it shall not be disposed of to city storm drains, curbs, curbs and cotter, gutters, and other parts of the city storm drain system. So this is really the basis of our code enforcement and um, what uh, we're talking about. Next slide. So as part of our stormwater program, we have a dedicated stormwater code enforcement team that handles only stormwater violations of the municipal code. And violations of the code will receive um, enforcement actions ranging anywhere from an educational letter to monetary fines, civil penalties, and even criminal charges um, on some really egregious situations. But the monetary fines that we typically give are administrative, and it's usually from $100 to $1,000, depending on uh, lots of different factors, and civil penalties that can sometimes reach up to, you know, usually start at $3,000, and I've seen them as high as $40,000, but it really depends on the situation. Um, so each time there's a violation from the same entity, property, um, or manager, the enforcement action escalates to the next level. So um, citation, you know, from like $100 will go up to $250, $500, $750, $1,000, $1, civil penalties, criminal, et cetera. And we do um, oftentimes start with the contractor or the property owner, depending on, you know, what information we have at the time. But we can also um, um, issue the enforcement actions to the property owner or the manager of that property. And that happens sometimes if we don't know who it is that's doing the violation, or if they're maybe they're continuing to do it over and over and we keep going out to the same area and it's the same folks doing the same thing and the enforcement actions don't seem to be making any difference, we will also go after the property owner or the manager of those contracts. And our intention is to stop these discharges, not punish people. We, so we wanna work with violators and provide the information to assist them to understand how to prevent pollution and to stop the discharges. Next slide, please. So a big part of our enforcement process is educating the public and businesses about what is and is not allowed and what our minimum best practice management practices are. So we have some really great um, fact sheets. We have this pressure washing one that's specific to this. And our um, this is our basic one that's like follow the three C's, which is contain, control, and capture any of your, your wastewater. Um, and so in a moment, I'm going to be start to just give you some examples of our minimum BMPs that I talked about earlier, but I do want to note that we don't give specific advice for any particular situation. Every situation is different. Every location, every contractor has different and, you know, different um, equipment, but we can give you a general idea of what is acceptable and what isn't. So I'm just going to show you some examples coming up here. But the most important thing to note is no runoff or wash water is allowed from the pressure washing process to enter the curb, street, inlet, or any other storm drain structure without being captured, without some kind of best management practice to prevent that runoff. Next slide. So oftentimes we we um, would we ask people to start with dry cleaning of the surfaces. So there's some examples here of someone like sweeping up some leaf litter, um, using some absorbent material on some oils or things like that, and also even like using a literal vacuum cleaner to clean it up before you do anything. Sometimes this kind of regular cleaning with dry methods prevents the need for any power washing at all, um, but it also just makes sure that you don't get that extra gunk clogging up your 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 stuff going into your um, your vacuums and that kind of thing. So we always uh, recommend you start with dry cleaning. Next slide. 
So again, no specific advice on which products, like, you know, what exactly you should use, but these are just a couple of common inlet protections. That is a, a really common BNP that a lot of folks use. Um, these are ones you can buy that you can reuse. You can stick over it, you know, put some sandbags there, make sure something doesn't get into the inlet. That's a, um, is sometimes people do this in case their, um, their other BNPs fail to make sure that nothing gets into the inlet or they're right next to the inlet. Um, also, you can see down in the corner here, there's this like um, sort of sock berm um, type of device, which you can use to protect the outlet. And you can also use it to divert your, um, divert the runoff into your vacuum or divert it onto a landscape surface. Any again, these are just some examples of things that we have seen. Next slide, please. All right, so this one just again, so it shows some examples of some things that we've seen. Um, no particular product is, you know, the best one. Um, but the, the picture up in the corner, sort of left um, right, or excuse me, the left upper corner shows someone um, discharging right into the landscaping. And that's what we would prefer. And we always, you know, um, say that it's like the first thing you can do if possible. I know it's difficult in an urban environment. There's not a lot of landscaping, but if there is, you can use one of those little sock berms to kind of direct it that direction. Or in this case, it's right there. So you can just kind of direct it into. So that's, that's one practice. Um, this kind of blue, um, hose with the, the gentleman in the photo right below it. You can see he's power washing the curb and the, or excuse me, the little driveway. And there's like a bladder there with a hose and it's actually sucking it up. And it's okay that it's in the curb or excuse me, in the gutter, um, only because it's not going anywhere. And it kind of has to be right there because of, you know, gravity. So there's one, one product. There's another one kind of in the middle there. That's like a hose that, um, completely contained the, contain the area. It's got a shop back that's attached to it. Um, and then this one on the upper right is kind of a really more fancier device, but it's pretty cool. It actually it, it works more like a carpet cleaner because it has that hose that delivers the water and then it actually takes it to a device that I don't have shown here, but it actually uh, reclaims the water, cleans it, and then they can use it over and over again. Um, and then there's another little uh, close-up shot of the uh, little like bladder bag. Um, next slide, please. So this is what not to do. We call it the no management practices for, for power washing. So we definitely would be um, would be enforcing on folks for if we saw something like this. So you can see that they're just no management practices whatsoever. It's just going straight onto the street. Some of it even looks soapy. There's no attempt whatsoever to do anything. So we just like to show like absolutely what not to do as well. And so that's all I have. So I guess I'm going to hand it off to Brian for the next section. Okay, thank you, Vicki. Uh, yes, I'm Brian Hojanaki with the uh, water conservation uh, section for the city of San Diego. Uh, the city, uh, uh, next slide, please. Um, the city of San Diego has been, in, oh, one back one more. Backwards, backwards. Sorry, my computer is glitching here. <laughs> yeah. One moment. On its own right now. Okay, sorry to, uh... okay, let me exit. Try this again. Okay. Okay, next slide. Uh, can you go back one? Mm, backwards to the beginning. <laughs> it doesn't mind if it's on right now, sorry, okay. Oh, there we go. Let's see if it stays there. Okay. Uh, so, uh, yes, we've been encouraging water conservation for over 30 years. Uh, we are one of the most water efficient cities in the state because of the programs and projects that we've uh, implemented. Uh, here in San Diego, we have very little access to natural water resources and rainfall. So our water must be purchased and transported from hundreds of miles away. Um, again, we have developed programs, rebates, and regulations for our water conservation, and uh, we must use it wisely. Next page, please. 
the city has water waste prohibitions. Uh, the city um, has a water conservation or ordinance which bans or regulates um, how water can be used in certain situations. Uh, if you'd like to see more of that uh, ordinance, you can go to wastenowater.org uh, when you get this PowerPoint sent to you. Uh, currently, one of the topics um, uh, that we're talking about for washing pavement is regulated in the municipal code as part of our permanent water waste restrictions. Uh, the language currently states customers shall not wash down sidewalks, driveways, parking areas, tennis courts, or other paved areas without using a power washer or a hose with a shutoff nozzle. Uh, washing any paved areas is only allowed to alleviate immediate safety or sanitation hazards. Water shall be collected and prevented from leaving the property and entering the municipal separate storm sewer system uh, like Vicki had just discussed with us. Uh, next uh, page, please. Um, for Again, on the water waste prohibitions, the municipal code does not provide a specific definition of an immediate safety or sanitation hazard. We encourage a good faith, reasonable review by you, the vendor or the contractor or the manager of uh, your area. But we do have some suggested topics, which would be visible signs of sanitation needs, presence of odor, high usage areas, or uh, any subject matter expert review in the profession that would be able to lend some guidance of, uh, of when an area needs to be cleaned. Uh, washing a paved area for aesthetic purposes would not be an immediate safety or sanitation hazard. Um, also, this municipal code does not provide guidance on how much water can be used for cleaning. Um, again, we encourage a good faith, reasonable review, uh, keeping in mind the water being used will need to be collected and uh, the public is watching you. Um, often uh, customers and citizens out in the, out in the community uh, will take pictures or video and send those to our uh, city for review and also to the state. So. Uh, just understand that there's there's eyes everywhere and they are watching uh, as these processes move forward. Uh, next page, please. Again, uh, Vicki talked a little bit about the uh, violations and penalties. Um, the Those same penalties and, and escalation of penalties is the same for water conservation. Um, it is... It, our current language for uh, our municipal code for water conservation is that it is unlawful for any customer to violate the mandatory provisions of this division. Violations are subject to criminal, civil, and administrative penalties and remedies. Uh, violations can be administered by either the city of San Diego or the state of California or both. Um, next slide, please. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about um, uh, drought declarations. Uh, here in San Diego, droughts re regularly occur within our region uh, and in the state of California. During these droughts, the city or the state may implement emergency regulations that may further impact uh, washing paved areas. Uh, during the past drought, there was uh, regulations that came from the state that was banning the washing of paved areas um, uh, with potable water unless there was an immediate need. Um, if this occurs during various, if droughts are, um, uh, if droughts are implemented um, for uh, the city or the state, uh, the city will notify uh, um, the public through local news stations, social media, uh, and it would also be updated on our website. Um, for further review of our water conservation efforts, programs, and regulations, uh, you can visit wastenowater.org and uh, see the programs that we have. And, um, and now I'd like to turn this over to uh, Lori Walsh with the San Diego Regional Water Quality Control Board. 
Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Brian, for that introduction. My name is Lori Walsh. I'm a supervising water resource control engineer for the San Diego Water Board. Um, I have two hats right now. I'm also the senior manager for the stormwater management unit. So I have um, seven stormwater professionals that report to me that oversee um, the regional MS4 permit for which the city of San Diego is a co-committee. Um, I want to give a little bit of introduction and some um, orient, orient this group. First of all, I'm very happy to be here because I am very interested in some of the questions and I can't wait to get to those later. Um, hopefully we can answer all your questions here. Um, when, so Brian and Vicki, they talk about uh, the city has regulatory authority over this particular activity of power washing as does the state of California. The city of San Diego is a permit T to the state of California. They have a permit to discharge waste to a water of the state or US. And that is what we're talking about here, controlling the discharges of pollutants to a receiving water body. And when the state of California issues a permit to the city of San Diego, we issue it to the entire city of San Diego, not just the stormwater management unit. So therefore the maintenance assessment districts are within the city of San Diego and all departments that are a part of the city are held to the standard um, regulations that are in this discharge permit. So next slide, please. Okay. I'd like to explain to this group why we're here. Uh, Brian mentioned, first and foremost, to conserve water. We live in a part of the country that imports, we're, we're heavily reliant on imported water. Um, there's a lot of um, energy effort and money being spent to become less dependent on the Colorado River imported water supply, like Brian mentioned. And um, the city of San Diego is actually a leader in that. We have the Pure Water Program where we are working, we, <laughs> I'm with you guys, where the city is um, taking, uh, spending the resources to treat wastewater to an advanced level uh, to turn it into drinking water. So we are conserving water. The second part is to protect water quality. This graphic right here and all of the pink lines, this is the San Diego Regional Board's um, boundary. The state of California is divided up into nine regional boards of which your maintenance assessment districts are within region nine within the city of San Diego. And these pink lines are all of our state waters and federal waters that are impacted by pollutants. They are impaired because of our discharge practices in this region. And the San Diego Water Board and the water boards in general are our authorities are to protect water quality so that they are, the water is safe to drink, so that it's safe to swim, so that it's safe to eat the fish uh, that we fish from our oceans, bays, and that our habitat and ecosystems are protected. So you may sit there and think this is just water going down the drain, um, but Vicki mentioned there's absolutely no treatment as soon as that water and any pollutants that it picks up leaves your sidewalks, driveways, buildings, it goes directly to a creek, river, stream, bay, wetland, ocean with no treatment, carries its pollutants right along with it. Next slide, please. You've heard this word a couple times. This discharge, and I wanna be very clear, without controls. Vicki's slide where there were no best management practices deployed during the activity to pressure wash or steam clean or power wash or hose down a sidewalk. If there's no controls put in place, those bladders, vacuum, um, 
covering inlets, uh, reducing the amount of water that's used, um, spraying it into grassy areas or landscapes. If none of that occurs, this is an illegal discharge. And it's a violation of every municipality's ordinance in the San Diego region, not just the city of San Diego. This is not special to the city of San Diego. And it's because we have 254 water bodies or water body segments that are impaired for some combination of pollutants um, and conditions within our region. So the water boards, um, it, it, it's our mission to protect and improve the water quality of our receiving waters so we can use it. Um, if I were in the room with all of you, I would ask for a show of hands on how many of you enjoy swimming in the ocean. And if you raised your hand, because I'm pretty sure we have all swam in our ocean or beaches before, we like to do that without getting sick. And that's what we're here to talk to you about today is helping us, helping the city, helping the state be able to improve the water quality so that it is safe to swim in our oceans. Um, many of these water bodies you can see are not just the ocean, there are inland creeks and rivers. And although we may not swim in our inland creeks and rivers, there are other beneficial uses that the water board uh, has the authority to protect and I'll show you those later. Next slide, please. This, uh, Brian mentioned, and I think Vicki might have mentioned too, that the public in your community are everywhere. And they do identify these types of discharges and they report them. Um, this is a location in La Jolla that most recently occurred and the public in this particular instance was my executive officer. So the executive officer of the San Diego Water Board was walking in La Jolla and came across this particular uh, gentleman pressure washing this sidewalk with no best management practices. And uh, unfortunately, uh, he was cleaning a sidewalk that had been painted green. And you can see the green uh, paint come off the discharge and enter the uh, curb. And, and make it to the curb inlet and be discharged. So our executive officer contacted this gentleman and education is really our first um, line of defense here. And um, well, I, I personally think it's conservation. So if if this was a steam clean perhaps with, but with controls in place, then not only would less water have been used, but um, no pollution would have been discharged into the storm drain. Um, but he spoke to this gentleman and educated him. And um, this actually, I understand from the city, ended up in a $500 fine. This was a person not associated with a maintenance assessment district, but I have another complaint that I've worked on that was. Um, and they have been educated now and also fined. Now the city can uh, fine a discharger because actually when I sent this complaint to Vicki, she had one of her code enforcement officers go there directly and respond. And actually the code enforcement officers also interfaced with um, either this gentleman or the, if the, he had a partner there, I'm not sure. Um, but and they talked to them and issued the citation but um, the state can also issue a fine for this type of discharge. Typically, our practice also is to educate uh, because education gets people to change their um, actions. And when people change their actions and do things differently, then pollution is controlled. And then um, hopefully it's not discharged to the receiving waters and maybe we get a few less than 257 impaired water bodies in our region. But the point here is that the state of California can issue fines in addition to what the city uh, might find an entity. We have discretion. Um, it's not that we go out and you know issue everybody a $10,000 fine. 
uh, we follow a similar um, hierarchy in terms of considerations that Vicki mentioned um, when it comes to um, taking enforcement against a particular activity. Um, next slide, please. Here is a, a an aerial view of this particular area. Again, the star shows where that discharge point, uh, the excuse me, where the activity occurred, where the pressure washing occurred, and the discharge to the curb and gutter occurred. Now, I'm I'm showing this because I want you all to understand what this means in terms of outcomes and why it matters. Uh, again, that paint, maybe some metals, could be bacteria. Um, could be sediment that comes off of that sidewalk, hits that curb and gutter, travels through a concrete pipe and gets discharged in this case to the Pacific Ocean, unless the city would tell me otherwise. But I know those storm drains must go to the left and get to the Pacific Ocean. Um, there's no other creek, river or bay that it would hit beforehand. Um, now I opened up this box on one of our maps that um, show you that it turned, it's not pink like the one above it, it turned blue because I selected it, but it is a segment of the Pacific Ocean shoreline that's impacted for bacteria. So I want you all to know also that your city staff spend um, a great deal of city resources to monitor these beach locations assess compliance with uh, criteria that protects water quality, that protects human health. So if these were swimmable beaches, which I'm not exactly sure because I can't, the, the print is too short, too small. Um, we are here protecting your ability and the people of the state of California and the people of the city of San Diego's ability to swim in those ocean, in the, at those beaches without getting sick. And I think we all now post COVID understand probably more about how exposure to contaminants can get us sick. And so these outcomes matter. So if we can control the pollutants at the source and not have them get into the storm drain, which is really only a conveyance system, it's a hardened surface conveyance system to remove water from our developed lands and get it to our flood control uh, system. And in this case, it goes directly to the Pacific Ocean and these water bodies are impaired. Next slide, please. So I'm here to ask the maintenance assessment districts to be a part of the solution with us and the city staff to control the discharges of pollutants to our receiving water bodies. This graphic shows San Diego Bay. And again, you see many pink lines as well as a pink San Diego Bay. And in this case, I had the pop-up block. It, you might or may not be able to see uh, that San Diego Bay is quite impaired for many more pollutants than just bacteria. And you might see uh, once you zoom in something called an HPWQC, that stands for a high priority water quality condition. And the city is a permittee, and they are one of many within the San Diego Bay watershed. And they, along with other cities, work to control pollutants within the watershed at large to control the any pollutants that would discharge to these high priority water quality conditions. And I'll, I mean, some of them say like benthic and macro invertebrate. So, you know, it's easy to understand protecting water quality in order for humans to be able to swim in it and not get sick. It's also easy to understand that to protect water quality so fish can live in it and we can fish the fish and eat the fish and not get sick. But it's a little less clear to understand that even the smallest of the smallest organisms that live in the surface sediments in San Diego Bay need to be protected in order to protect the food web. 
and most of us have had basic uh, biology and science and understand that importance as well. So the high priority for San Diego Bay is bacteria, it's these metals, it's trash. And when contractors or when people pressure wash sidewalks for the reasons Brian mentioned, even sanitary issues, the expectation is that these contractors do it in a way to control pollutants, because if they don't, then it is an illegal discharge and it is a contributor to the water quality that we're seeing in our creeks, streams, bays, wetlands, and you know our San Diego Bay here. Next slide, please. These are our beneficial uses. And you've heard me talk about safe to swim, safe to eat, habitat and ecosystems. The Water Board is charged with protecting all 26 of these beneficial uses. And not all 26 are in every single water body, but each water body has multiple beneficial uses. So when the power washer in La Jolla is removing paint from a green sidewalk or piles of dog waste or excrements from hum humans, um, because I know what your pressure washers are trying to do to keep the hardened surfaces clean, clear, sanitized, aesthetically free from debris. But when they do it with no controls, it impacts something like number 22, the ability for fish to spawn or reproduce. Or maybe it affects number 13, like the warm freshwater habitat. So certain habitat is required for certain species. And if that water changes the temperature, it could impact that. So I just want to show these to you so you can increase your understanding of why the city and the state of California feel that it is important to control this particular activity because it happens everywhere. It's not just in your maintenance districts, but it would be much better if within your maintenance districts, your contractors were educated and did this activity properly so it's not illegal and it does contribute to improvements in water quality, not contributes to degradation in water quality. Next slide, please. So I really want to leave you with this ask. Now that you know, or maybe you've learned a little something new today, we could really use your help. It's not going to, um, you know, if we can turn one of these water bodies from pink to not pink, that's improvement. Incremental improvement is what the Water Board is really seeking to achieve, as well as the city. Um, and it just will, improvements in water quality are going to improve um, the lives of the community. Uh, and we want to be able to use our water bodies. We want to be able to conserve water and hopefully get this map to look a little different over time. So with that, I will end it. And I really appreciate everybody's attendance and uh, patience and attention listening to this. Thank you very much for having me. Thanks, Lori. Uh, we're gonna move into just a couple more slides about our role as administrators of the MAD contracts. Um, and then we're gonna open it up for questions. We've left a substantial amount of time for questions. I see two really good ones, one from Ben, one from Scott. Um, so we're going to, we have the right people here to answer those questions. We're going to dive into those in just a minute. If we can move on to the next slide, please. I wanted to bring your attention to uh, two sections within the uh, the contract um, that, that are both applicable to, um, to power washing. Um, in your scope, Exhibit B, including Section F on sidewalk steam cleaning shown here, um, section G on requirements of district managers and subcontractors provides more detail about your responsibilities about 
uh, the manner in which these services are carried out, such as clean work area, method of um, performing work, safety requirements. Uh, hopefully through this presentation, you can get a sense of, of where you stand with compliance and um, if there are any adjustments that need to be made. Um, when you're out of compliance with any component of these regulations, you're out of compliance with the MAD contract. That's the big takeaway here. Because our contract requires that you follow all local and state laws, that means any violations here mean you're out of compliance with our contract. Um, as many of you know, or you've seen, um, our priority is always education first. As you heard from Lori, same thing here, education first. We wanna be good partners. We wanna work through issues to help our contractors come into compliance with their contracts. That's, our, that's always number one. Um, but it doesn't mean we don't have the responsibility to, um, to, to help everyone come into compliance. So if there is an issue and we're not making progress, you will start to see um, different uh, tactics being taken by our office to, to push um, our contractors into coming com into compliance. And that could be um, anything up to not renewing the contract uh, with an organization. So we do take all of this very seriously. Um, moving on to the next slide. Uh, there's a section in the MAD contract on subcontractors. I wanna ask you to review that again. Um, you are responsible for compliance of your subcontractors. Making sure they're properly insured is a big one. Um, best practices include spot checks, re uh, regular reports, ongoing communication. Okay, um, on the last slide of my set, um, we have some contact information from everyone you heard from today, for everyone you heard from today. Um, you know, I want you to take a moment, screenshot it. Um, we can, we always have this information available if you need to reach out to us. Uh, but the number one takeaway I'm hoping everyone gets from today is that we're all, we're all trying to just come into compliance, right? We're trying to do the right thing. Uh, we're here to help. We're not going to go attacking our partners. We're going to work through complaints as they come in. We're going to help everyone come into compliance and we're going to be stronger as a program for it. So that's where we stand. Um, I'm going to go back to Rhea just for a moment to, to ask if I missed anything um, and if she'd like me to kind of navigate the Q&A. Um, no, I think you've, you've touched on everything. Just a reminder to folks that we will be providing a copy of the recording to everyone as well as a copy of the slide deck. So that will come later this afternoon after we wrap up. Um, looks like we have a couple of questions in the chat. Sean, if you feel comfortable just reading those off. You know, I, I think um, I'll give the option to those that have typed them out um, to, to ask the question themselves. Uh, obviously, I think our presenters have had an opportunity to read those and think about them as we've um, gone through our presentation, but it couldn't hurt to let them speak in their own voice. Um, ben, do you want to go first? Sure. Thanks for the opportunity. And I really appreciate this conversation. Um, there's so many moving parts and the, this, the, uh, the, the map is very helpful to show just how much of an impact this is. And my question is related to the technical definition of um, the storm drain system. The gutter was listed at the start of the presentation as part of the storm drain system. Uh, and we're not allowed to impact the storm drain system. However, the examples of the BMPs that were shown show water collecting in the gutter. And um, we've been told that the gutter is part of the storm drain system and you cannot impact the storm drain system at all. So I just want to be clear and clarify or, or have you clarify, it is okay to have the water pool in the gutter ahead of being reclaimed, provided that the drain itself is protected, or is it are we not allowed to impact the gutter because it's part of the storm drain system? Is that Becky, do you want to take the first crack at that and then we'll let Lori add on if she's like? Yeah, I can I can answer that. Um so from our perspective, I mean sometimes you have no choice. In fact, can you go back to the the slides with the the photos of the BMPs? That would be really helpful. Um sometimes, you know, there's a there's a curb or there's a driveway or whatever. You you sometimes you have to collect it there. So there has to be 
it can't be running all the way down the street. It needs to be collected at the point that is draining. Um, so sorry, I'll let you get that slide up so I can show uh, the third one down there. Yeah, that one. Yeah, so you can see like there's, it's in the gutter, but it really, you really have no choice. There's no way to, to collect it otherwise. Mm -hmm. So that's okay. As long as the gutter has been, uh, the curb, excuse me, has been cleaned up. There's no like debris flowing. It's, you can see it's pooling right there. It's not going around it. That is okay from our perspective. Um, a lot of times we ask people if it was right next to the inlet, cover the inlet as well, just in case a little escapes and you can you need to collect it there. But it cannot go like all the way down the street and you know be collected, um, you know, two blocks down. Um, and the, the gutter also needs to be swept up, by the way. Any any kind of like debris or anything that's in the gutter has to be cleaned. That's part of the BMP process typically as well. Thank you for that. Sure, you're welcome. Yeah, and I agree with Vicky. Um Technically, by the letter of the law, uh, Benjamin, you're right. The that curb and the minute that water touches the curb, it is considered a discharge into the MS4. But the outcome of best management practices, like Vicky explained, with that bladder right there in in the curb, is that the pollutants have not been discharged. There has been no impact. And that's what the regulations and the law are looking to protect. Yeah. So technically, yes, it's a discharge to the MS4, but Vicki's right. I think there's where the discretion occurs and the control practices are in place. Um, you obviously, everybody sees the difference between her do not do slides and the best management practice slides. But in this case, um, Sometimes you can't put the bladder right there. All the cars are there or, you know, you reasonable and prudent is what's part of the criteria as well as these particular discharges are occur when it's not raining, right? The stormwater permit distinguishes between stormwater, which is actual rainwater occurring when it's raining and these are discharges that we call non-stormwater discharges. And the permit requires them to be effectively prohibited. So the effective word is important. And with controls like are pictured here, that is an effective prohibition. And that's what Vicki's team's looking at in the city, as well as the water board. And the enforcement officers are aware of that latitudes, right? It's This is something that the enforcement officers who are out in the field at two in the morning or whatever, they are aware of this latitude. Is that yeah. Yep. Yeah? Okay. So when we get, if I could follow up to, just to keep going, we, we do have the time for this. If, um, if we have a community member that's not aware of that, um, how does the city respond when um, we have someone, a community member out there that says, no, it touched the storm drain system. I'm making a complaint. How does the city respond to that? And then how does the water board respond to that? Um, well, typically we work with um, complainants and explain to them the situation. If they, if they give us their contact information and they're willing to chat with us about it, we oftentimes reach out to them for more information or witness statements or whatever. So we're oftentimes in contact with them. Um, so we usually explain it that way and, you know, say, well, there were BMPs in place. They were, you know, vacuuming it up. This isn't a discharge. This isn't a violation. We do explain that to people when they um, provide their information and we're able to reach out to them. Anything to add, Laurie? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the water board spends hours and hours and hours also assisting the city and responding to the public. And like I said, um, in these cases, if the public were to, to ask that question, uh, technically it is not allowed. It is an illegal discharge. But again, the, the point here and the outcome that occurs is that the discharge of pollutants was effectively prohibited in the examples shown here uh, in Vicki's slide. Um, in, the ter in terms of um, complaints that uh, Vicki and I have experienced dealing with, um, there we often do see uh, folks do 
um, the no BMP option and then report to the board or the city that they did have BMPs in place. And sometimes they'll throw a hose in the curb and it's completely ineffective. So that's the key. Um, did the pollutants really get prohibited from being discharged uh, ultimately and, and impacting receiving waters? That's kind of what we're both looking at, but yeah, you know, it's, it's illegal to go 66 miles per hour on the freeway, isn't it? But are you going to get a ticket for going 66 miles on the freeway? Probably not. And I use that analogy a lot. Okay, I see Ben, they have another question. Don't let me forget, but I'm gonna go to Scott next um, to make sure everyone gets a chance. Scott, do you wanna uh, speak for yourself or would you like me to read it? Uh, so we were taping our inlets down uh, at the street fair this weekend. We've been doing that, I don't know, 12, 15 years, whenever the policy was enacted. Never happened before, but one of the rates just dropped out. So now we have like a, you know, an eight foot drop. So we covered it with plywood and barricades. But when the uh, when uh, streets got here Monday to fix it, they said, well, they've never seen that they're made that that's not supposed to happen it was obviously you know messed with before we touched it i guess uh but just a question is is that has that does that happen what do you do when it happens like the street says well you should have called us right away but i'm like well there's ten thousand people here and we we covered it up and you couldn't have gotten your trucks in here um and so anyway just thought I threw it out since it just happened. It's fresh in my yeah. mind. Yeah, Scott, thank you for that. Um, yeah, I mean, the only thing you can really do is just call it in right away like you did. I mean, I know you had to wait till after the event. I think since it was covered, I mean, I can't speak for them, but um, yeah, I, I mean, I'm not really familiar if it's ever happened before, but certainly, you know, stuff happens and just call it in and they'll come and fix it as soon as they can. Something like that is considered a high priority, so I'm sure they would come out, you know, as soon as possible. Yeah, they possible. came. We called them Monday. They were out here within like an hour or something. Yeah, uh, that's an that's an emergency situation for sure. We yeah. can't have to drop like that. So, so no one, the they're made. I mean, if they're not supposed to do that, what? I mean, you know, we're just. I didn't see it myself. My guys were out there, but we're putting our, you know, we're, we're trying to follow direction and then we create a hazard. And I'm just, I'm just bringing it up in cases other people have had this happen to them. What do we do when, um, you know, cause you're power washing, it happens when you got water and machines out there and stuff. Um, I just don't want to put people in an unsafe position. That's why I'm bringing it up. Thank you. And I'll just say from the um, board's perspective, people have been um, covering those drains, not not the far part that I got damaged and everything that's Vicky's, but, you know, covering storm drains during big events like that are very effective in keeping trash out. Trash is a huge pollutant that the state and the city is dealing with um, in many cases. And so they're very effective. That's an effective way to keep all the trash out of the inlet doesn't keep it out of off the sidewalk or out of the gutter, but it sure does keep it off the inlet. And, you know, power washing or pressure washing is not the only way to pick up trash. I want to reiterate, you know, Vicki mentioned sweeping things, vacuuming things, very effective also. Um, spot cleaning, very effective. Uh, with a big event like you're talking about, Scott, you know, it could be vacuuming or broom sweeping or things like that. I'm not sure the specific situation if something needed to be pressure washed, but um, these BMPs that are put in place are very effective. If any of you, I encourage you all to go to YouTube and Google the difference between a steam cleaner and a pressure washing. And you are going to see a big difference, you know, five minutes, four minutes on these videos, very effective. And it also gives you some information, which is very powerful when you have your contractors come out. I do highly encourage you to go and do spot checks of them and make sure that they are doing what they said they were going to do when you awarded them a contract. They're getting paid good money 
to provide you a service and they shouldn't put you in jeopardy of being in violation of this particular city ordinance or state law at that case, at that um, point. But again, it's the why. I don't want anybody to forget why we're doing this. And that the view of our region with all those pink creeks is the reason why. Thank you. Okay, um, I'm gonna go to Brian next, then we'll go to Denny, then um, back to Ben. So Brian? All right, thank you. I'm gonna go back to my question, but I, I know it just from memory, groundwater discharge. So uh, could you explain to me and everybody, although I, I understand it and have worked with it, being a member of uh, uh, an associate, Lawyer Shores Association, groundwater discharge that comes from commercial buildings or residential buildings is a legal discharge uh, well, I say legal, uh, when reported, the city uh, will come back and say that it, it is a legal discharge. Uh, but often we don't know what building it's coming from, you know, what source it is, uh, whether the city has uh, determined that it is a legal discharge. Can you talk a little bit about that, please? Sure. Yeah, I can definitely talk about that. So. It's definitely a, not an easy answer to your question because it really depends on each and every discharge, but we go through a very thorough process to determine if something is groundwater or not. Um, we have our monitoring team go out and, and sample and make sure that it meets all the isotopes that are groundwater and then it cannot be contaminated with any, any of our, you know, any pollutants whatsoever. It has to be completely uncontaminated groundwater. It is a legal discharge in certain cases. And again, if it's completely uncontaminated and if, if it comes from a residential versus a business, it can't be pumped or if it is pumped, you have to get a um, um, permit from the regional board. Lori can maybe talk about that a little bit more, um, but it really just depends on the specific situation. And we do have some locations that we have gone out to many times that have determined that they're groundwater. Um, and we go through a very thorough investigation. Like I said, sometimes the, the property owner will have a pump or they won't have a pump or it'll be coming out of their French drain or whatever. So we um, were, I definitely, there's a lot in La Jolla as well. I'm very aware there's a really, a lot of groundwater out there, but it really just depends on the situation. And we go through a lengthy process to determine if it's a legal discharge or not. Thank you, Victoria. How, yeah. how are we to determine, um, can our MAD be notified or how do we, so if we come onto a building, which we did a couple months ago, and there was a significant amount of water coming down the streets. And it was also creating a slip hazard because of the green moss that accumulates day after day, um, or it's near a pedestrian crosswalk. How are you know? How do we verify that that's happening? Because we're not notified from the city because we're not notified. And so, how, how do I how do I get confirmation that everything is okay? Yeah, I would reach out. You can either submit a, um, you can send, uh, you can send an email to the SWPPP email address. I think I don't know what was on here. It's SWPPP at um, San Diego .gov and um, and and ask that question, and it'll come to us. Ask for code enforcement, and we can um, you can route that to us, and we'll check to see if it's a groundwater location. Um, or if you you can always just submit a complaint um, through the Get It Done app. And then we'll review and double check, see if it's on that location. Cause you know, we can't be everywhere all the time. Sometimes it's not a groundwater location. So it's really helpful if you see a discharge anytime, please just submit it and we'll confirm that for you. Yeah. And, um, and it'll it'll have a, a response on the, um, oh, thank you for putting that up there, Nicole. <laughs> Nicole, our code enforcement supervisor is listening and she just put the address on there, uh, the email address in the, in the chat. Okay, very well. We will yeah. we will do so. Thank you. Yeah. And my information was on here too, so you can reach out to me if you'd like. And Brian, I would just add too, if there is um, algae growth or any of that sort of ponding, um, when you submit the Get It Done report, we can also refer that to our operations division to um, send a street super out to sweep up the algae. Um, so just yeah. include that information when you submit the reports. Yeah, yeah. that's a great concern to us. Is the uh, is this the slip hazard that groundwater creates? Groundwater discharge creates. 
Yeah, Brian, and from the state of California or the regional board's perspective, um, the city uh, does do a, a good job to investigate. They do the sampling and they make the determination of whether or not that groundwater discharge contains pollutants or not. And if it is, uh, if it does not contain pollutants, then the city's permit with the state does allow uncontaminated discharge from a groundwater discharge into the MS4, remember, because there's no treatment, but it's not causing or contributing to an impairment of water quality. Therefore, it is a authorized discharge. In the cases Vicki mentioned, pumped or unpumped, uh, the state has a permit that some uh, buildings need to get if they pump groundwater. And the reason that the distinction of pumping groundwater is we're actually taking some sort of action to control that water. And when you pump groundwater, you can take, you can drag pollutants from other locations into that groundwater. And it usually means that pumping is necessary to either draw down groundwater to protect foundations, keep it out of parking structures, things of that nature, and the quantity of discharge increases. And that can then cause or contribute to an impairment to a water body. So that's some of the reasons why you hear pumping versus not pumping. If it's gravity fed, which much of our developed land is gravity fed with retaining walls, we have French drains and things like that, that remove water to reduce the hydrostatic pressure behind those sorts of structures. That's the reason those are there. So a lot of times that is a natural groundwater or a perched irrigated land type of water, and it is smaller in volume and doesn't contain uh, as many pollutants. So those are some of the distinctions between some of the vocabulary that we're using. Thank you. Okay. Um, Danny, and then we'll go back to Ben. Danny? Um, let me preface this by saying, I think the city is still doing this, but every quarter they send a truck, a water truck out here with a sprayer and they spray some sort of disinfectant on our sidewalks because of the um, health outbreaks that we had, uh, health concerns years back. And, um, but they don't recapture anything. They just spray it all over the sidewalks. And we have a terrible problem with human waste and animal waste on our sidewalks, but especially regarding the human waste. How do you imagine we could legally clean this up without having to pick it up in our hands? Vicki, do you want to start? I mean, I certainly have comments, but uh, yeah, I mean, I can talk a little bit about the stormwater side of things. One thing I didn't mention earlier is that we do also encourage like, you know, spot cleaning. And sometimes that's literally just, yeah, scooping things up with a scooper or something. Um, also spot cleaning with like a mop and a bucket and that kind of thing, just so there's no runoff. And again, as long as there is no runoff and it's not going and you, if you, if you do have to steam clean or you do have to power wash, that's okay. As long as you you collect that water and it does not go out to the, the uh, storm drain. And Denny, I'll, I'll give you firsthand experience during the HEPA outbreak at the city of San Diego. I purposefully went down to the area to see how they were doing things at that time. I think it was 17th Street or something along those lines where I was walking behind uh, environmental services who was picking up all the solid waste material. And then the contractor was going and spraying the beach bleach solution on the sidewalks. Now, um, both the city and the county consulted with the San Diego Water Board at that time, me, and reviewed the best prep best management practices that were being used when they were applying it. At that time they were applying it, a person had like a container and more of a sprayer. So the sprayer was really misting the sidewalk to the point where it was wet, but there was no runoff at that time. So the expectation would be that if it is being sprayed using a truck, perhaps now, I'm not sure, and spraying the sidewalk that it's probably wetting it 
with a bleach solution of some concentration to be effective, but not have the runoff occur, like Vicki said. Um, and then for other maintenance assessment districts, maybe in, in other areas, um, you can have your contractor have the skills to and, and have the people to be trained appropriately to protect themselves if they are picking up human waste or trash or other things like that, to be trained properly, to do it properly, to protect themselves and also accomplish the activity of picking up the waste. So that might be an additional consideration when you're picking a contractor to do this work. But um, so they can do the spot cleaning like that, uh, pick up the waste and do it. Because here's the thought from the water board's perspective. And I, I saw, am I right with 17th Street? Was that right in San Diego, 15th Street? It's right when you get on so. the 5 South or something over there. It's a very uh, concentrated area where folks experiencing homelessness do uh, have their tents and their materials and things. So um, in areas um, maybe other than that sort of um, situation, you know, it's not where waste is spread on every square inch of the sidewalk. That's not how it, it gets done. So there is an expectation that spot cleaning can should be tried first instead of just spraying the whole thing down and, and having it get into the storm drain. So that logic is is where the board is coming from. I know city, um, Vicki and her staff have that mindset as well to try to, you know, tier it where do this first, if that doesn't work, if it's a situation where there's a bunch of tents, I know there's a 72 hour notice that has to happen. Environmental services comes out, the people's get uh, notified that they need to move. I also know that they come right back. I know that many people experiencing homelessness know the system and they work the system. So the board understands that. And I work with the city staff in many cases, cleanups in the river, um, cleanups at public places. Um, I now have experience in two maintenance assessment districts. So I am also getting more educated on how the different areas are experiencing different things. Hopefully that answers your question or helps. Yeah, Lori, thank, thanks for putting that part out. I forgot to mention that you do need to be trained with like hazardous waste cleanup for human waste. For animal waste, it's a little different story, but um, for human waste, you do need to have those, follow those hazardous waste um, protocols. John, okay. I don't know if you have anything to add to that. No, okay. I think we can go back to Ben for his second question. And that would be the last question we have in the queue. If anyone else has any other questions, please um, raise your hand or go ahead and put them in the chat now and we'll make sure to get to you. Ben? Thanks, Sean. Um, and I appreciate um, some, some of the question was answered um, through Danny's question, but this kind of dovetails on that. Um, we do see pretty regularly uh, MTS contractors and city of San Diego contractors out and about and sometimes they're just spraying the solution. And so I, I appreciate that if you spray a solution and it's not gonna hit the storm drain, that, that's, that's, that's good information. Um, but are there exceptions to this system? Is there a scenario where you could have a city contractor out steam cleaning a bus stop or an MTS contractor steam cleaning a bus stop and ignoring your BMP rules. Is there any scenario where that could happen? Some sort of state waiver or, you know, it's an emergency or whatever. Is there a situation like that? Or or if we see a contractor out there doing this stuff, breaking the rules. We, okay, we so you have a lot of, you yeah. have breaking the rules in there and then an exception. So that, the one yeah. thing- Is there an so, exception? No. Um, <laughs> No. Yeah. Okay. So you bring up MTS. Uh, MTS is also uh, permitted by the state of California. They have a permit to um, a stormwater permit. They're in our phase two, uh, which is a smaller municipality permit, statewide permit. So MTS is expected to comply with the rules the same way the city of San Diego is. And our executive officer takes the trolley regularly and has reported those discharges to me. And I've called MTS personally on those matters as well. So if you 
do find that MTS in your area is not following the rules as you understand them, you can let uh, me know. You can fill out a complaint from the Cal EPA complaint. We have an environmental complaint link, link on our website. Um, you can report it to the city. If the city recognizes that it's MTS, they know to reach out to my staff as well. Um, you mentioned exception. Um, and most, okay. Vicky's picture in here, the one with the person using the kind of controlled system, and then there's a hose feeding the water and a hose reclaiming the water. In that case, that water gets reclaimed treated, it probably gets filtered and maybe some sort of splash of chlorine or something to disinfect. I'm not sure what the system is, but it is considered reclaimed water. And it's water that's been used more than once. In that case, that might, and only because I don't know the technology, I haven't looked at the quality of the water that the system claims it can meet. In that case, because it's reclaimed water, might be able to be discharged and would be allowed because the water conservation regulations that Brian mentioned are to protect potable water. Most all of these activities, power washing, are done using potable water. And that is the water that we seek to conserve to be able to have it for our uses over the long term. Um, I also wanted to mention that the conservation regulations, the emergency ones that Brian mentioned, those are um, adopted by the State Water Resources Control Board, my parent agency. The regions do not write those regulations or enforce those regulations. Those are written and enforced at the State Water Resources Control Board staff. And that um, the emergency regulation that prohibits pressure washing hard surfaces is still in effect till December of 2023 this year, unless the state board extends that for any reason. So that is still in effect as, and that's, you know, usually I think, well, I'll just say that that's still in effect till uh, December of 2023. So no, then MTS, really doesn't have an exception. Uh, they are held to the same standards as your maintenance assessment districts are and the city is. Yeah, Lori, I'd like to add to that too. Uh, we don't have any exceptions for not having BMPs in place. You have to have something, there can't be runoff, it can't be going into the drain um, from a city perspective. So if you do ever see something like that, we please encourage everyone to take photos, video, get as much information as you can and submit it either to get it done or to that email address that we put in the chat earlier, the SWPPP at San Diego.gov, because those are violations and we will investigate them. Doesn't matter who's doing it, where it's coming from, we will investigate. But we need as much info as possible. Like if the, you know, pictures of the what they're doing, um, of it going into the street, um, of photos of their, you know, who like the name of the company, if that's if that's there, just just something, as much information as you can possibly give us that would um we need that, but please, we can't be everywhere all the time. So please send those things into us. Yeah, and I agree with Vicki 100%. I ask that everybody do it safely. Yes. Very okay. safely. Yeah. You're in the street, you're behind parked cars. People get very irritated and aggravated if you're taking a picture of them. Just mm -hmm. be careful. It's not worth your safety for sure. But videos and pictures are extremely helpful to Vicki and her staff, as well as me and my staff. And if people follow the line of the water and show us that it actually got into the inlet, very helpful. Um, let's see. And uh, like I said, videos, we do accept that as evidence. Uh, we upload them to our FTP site, but please be safe. Okay, it looks like one more. Ben, go ahead and we have time. Sorry about this. I. Um... You mentioned the public. We have some very active members of the public in our community, so I have a lot of questions. Um, so, so there was an example that you gave earlier of uh, the the folks in La Jolla um, cleaning up the sidewalk or 
and it had paint in the in the discharge water. Now, if they had reclaimed that water into a container or whatever with the vacuum system, as the BMPs would suggest, what can they then do with that water? Right? Is it like it's full of paint? So, is there? Can they just dump it in the landscaping next door, or can they put it down the sewer or down the the drain in their office or and if so is there some sort of special commercial discharge permit you need or so what do you do with the the, the reclaimed water once you suck up all that delicious nutrient rich water <laughs> is that a and good metals and whoever else knows yeah. what's in paint um, yeah. yes so uh anybody from the city correct me if i step out of bounds but um if you were to uh, technically to take that, say there's um, two five gallon buckets that are, you know, green, greeny discharge waste. Um, technically, you know, if you came in to your place of business and you put it down the sink, it's going to go to the wastewater treatment plant. Um, some wastewater treatment plants, they have a pretreatment that may actually treat that, um, but it's really not allowed. Uh, it would be, you would have to get, a. let me see, is that right, Vicki? You do have to get a permit from the city uh, yeah. to actually discharge to their uh, sanitary sewer collection system. Now, is somebody going to do that for two five-gallon buckets worth of, you know, pink contaminated water? My suggestion would probably be to take it to uh, something small like that. You might be able to take it to the household hazardous waste. If you're a business, you might have to get some sort of additional permit or contractor yourself to handle your waste stream. If you are a pressure washing, power washing business, and you know that you create X number of gallons, 500 gallons a week of contaminated water, you may need to go provide, find yourself a service that accepts that kind of water and treats it appropriately via the appropriate mechanisms. Vicki, anything else you think? No, that, that's correct. That's how I understand it as well. Um, I can't speak for our public utilities department that would handle that end of things or, but yes, it's a contaminated water like that typically is not accepted in the sewer. So, yeah, so the, I mean, we're not talking about five gallon buckets. We're talking about a lot of water uh, if you, in, you know, just for Hillcrest, you know, we're at pressure washing all the time, at least that is our goal. And so we're talking about a lot of water. It, it, and so there's the, if you want to put it down the storm, uh, down the sewer, you, you have to get a permit, I guess. If, what if you wanted, what if you had, if you were a contractor and you were like, uh, my, you know, I'm out in the middle of nowhere out on the farm, I just going to take it home and dump it in my backyard. Is that, is that acceptable? like into the landscaping of my own backyard. Well, that would be a discharge of waste to land. And again, <laughs> it, you're going to get you're going to get into it depends how much yeah. water are you talking? Will it create runoff? Does it discharge to groundwater? Would it impact groundwater at all? Um let's say in the bestest of scenarios that it was 5,000 gallons a week and your a home business and your home is out in unincorporated county and you uh via a very slow discharge you decant your discharge to your back property um would that be legal probably not because you're discharging you, you, those pollutants are going to get stuck in your ground it, it will fil filter the ground will filter it um, from the water board's perspective, it's all about, did you cause or contribute to a condition of pollution, contamination, or nuisance? That's, that's the law for the water board that, that we try to, that we enforce with our permits, is we issue permits that have controls in place to prevent conditions of pollution, contamination, or nuisance. And it's to both ground, groundwater, surface water, so you might be able to decant that water very slowly and 
not cause a condition of pollution, contamination, or nuisance. But if you discharged 5,000 gallons every week to your back lot, over time, you are going to create a condition of pollution, contamination, or nuisance. That, that's, that was my understanding. So I appreciate the clarification, and, and it is something that I think you know, the contractors and, and anyone that's doing this directly has should consider because it's not it's not as obvious as all of that, right? And so I, I appreciate that clarification and uh, thank you for that. Welcome. Uh, we could go to Brianna. I think she has one more thing to add. Yeah, just Ben, since we brought up that La Jolla incident, I wanted to add another layer of problems with that is that those were unlicensed contractors who were just sort of going door to door asking businesses if the businesses wanted them to power wash their windows and sidewalks. Um, so I think that just sort of adds the importance on your maintenance assessment districts and the importance of the subcontracts that you have and, you know, those being official contracts where you're able to practice that oversight and make sure they're complying with stormwater requirements and water conservation requirements, and then communicating that to your members, that that's why all this stuff really needs to go through you um, because of situations like this. Very that good. was all to add. Thank you. Uh, Scott, you have one more? Yes, What do any cities treat their stormwater discharge before it gets dumped into rivers or streams or lakes? Wouldn't that be best practices? Because it isn't most of the stormwater going in from rain versus human inaction when the rain comes. Anyway, do is that does that happen or, or that doesn't happen? Well, I think that it depends, right? <laughs> like generally, um, we can't because there's just so much of rainwater, but we do have a lot of stormwater capture projects that are occurring right now, um, especially with pure water coming online soon. We're looking at opportunities for us to be able to capture stormwater and send it to the pure water system so it can be used um, as drinking water. Um, I don't know, Brianna, if you want to add anything to that, she's our deputy director. Yeah, I would just say that in other cities, mostly on the East Coast, there's actually a combined sewer system, the wastewater and the stormwater. So, you know, that's just the way those cities were built out. And so the stormwater in those cases are treated. That's just not how San Diego was built. So unless we're able to divert it to the sewer system in certain cases, and there are different restrictions on that, it's not treated in San Diego. Yeah, that's true. Uh, and mostly, you know, stormwater conveyance systems were designed to remove water from the developed land surface as fast and as safely as possible to avoid flooding and protect uh, life and safety. Um, in Orange County, they do have some diversions, stormwater diversions, and they treat it, um, but it's mostly for protection of swimming, rec one contact, water recreation, beneficial use on the beaches. There's quite a few of those along the Orange County beaches. Uh, we don't have too many of them here in San Diego, one in uh, Encinitas, uh, Moonlight Beach, and I think there's maybe another one or two, but uh, it's escaping me right off the top of my head. But, yeah. And is it too expensive for the county or this region or the state to begin to install those? Is it a matter of money or is it just that you there's too much water and it's impossible to do it? You'll flood behind yourself well in the case of those diversions for protection of beach you know the beaches the beach water quality and human health water contact recreation you know swimming um those were put in place um actually a lot of the orange county you know 20 years ago they were supposed to be temporary solutions because what we should be doing is controlling pollution at the source which is what we've been talking about for the last hour. It's controlling pollution at the source. So we don't have to have a treatment system that's at the base of the watershed, you know, draining hundreds of thousands of acres of land into one point location and then cleaning it just to protect the beach. Because what that doesn't do is it doesn't protect any of the creeks. It doesn't protect the wetlands. It doesn't protect the... Um, the bays, it doesn't protect anything up gradient. All of that suffers the pollution impact um, just for the protection of the beach water quality. So that's also part of the consideration. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and um, our wastewater treatment plants aren't big enough or designed for large amounts of rainwater during a rain event. Um, so it would be all the infrastructure would need to be ripped up and put back in and, you know, new plants built. It would just be nearly impossible for something like that to happen. Well, you know, in the news, we can't help hearing about the Tijuana sewer issues, the uh, runoff. But I mean, that also is, yeah, it doesn't work, but it should work. So, I mean, it's going to take a lot of money. I'm just wondering is if, you know, is it... Uh, <clears throat> Wouldn't that be more effective to, I mean, you, I, I've learned a lot today and it seems that even if there are a bunch of us that could do the best things, it seems like there's 10 times as many of us that are not, that you, you can't talk to and they're not going to do it. So they're going to continue to pollute. And so you're not going to catch them. And so how do you, how do you keep it from going? You know, I'm just. I'm just wondering if it's a question of there's no money or no will to do that, uh, like there is in the Tijuana issue. It's been like that for, you know, 30 years or something, and it never gets done. And then, I mean, it's kind of ironic, you know, we got all this horrible sewage going in there, and we're worrying about, a, you know, a few gallons that we might be treating. And, and we're all exposed to that contradiction. And so, yes, just bringing it up because it's in the news a lot lately. No, it's a great point. Um, and just for everyone's information here, uh, the Tijuana sewage issue, um, you know, complicates, it's complicated because there's two countries involved. Uh, and the majority of the impacts that are being caused on our beaches are from the sewage, the raw sewage that's being discharged further south in Mexico, not the discharges that are going through the International Boundary and Water Commission treatment plant, which gets treated to secondary, treated and discharged via an ocean outfall, which is how we treat sewage in the United States. The problem is, is that when um, the flows, there's corruption and so much infrastructure that is uh, broken down and not maintained in Mexico that the international boundary plant gets overwhelmed and then doesn't provide the treatment. But even so, it's still going through the ocean outfall. That's not the one that's impacting our beaches. It is the discharge of raw sewage, I believe at Punta de Banera. It's further south that um, comes, gets traveled north along our beaches. That's what's causing, you know, over two years of closed beach in Imperial Beach. Yes, you're right. Um, because just because we have we do have that very serious situation that's been going on for years and years and years, um, does that mean we just throw up our hands and don't do what we can to control pollution um, from this particular activity? No, I think we do what we can where we can. And the water board is got their eye on the Tijuana situation every day that's underneath my branch now. And um, we all have to do our parts in order to make the difference, uh, albeit small. So just because we've got Tijuana going on down there doesn't mean that we can discharge metals to Choice Creek or that we can discharge trash to San Diego Bay. So we, all, we have the same water bodies, but there's different pollutants involved as well. And the Tijuana matter is trash and bacteria and all the things that come with those types of discharges. But in these other areas where maybe um, the pressure washing that's going on is, is removing sediment or sand or you know stuff from certain areas and that's impacting different beneficial uses in different water bodies. So we have that to consider too. So um, I just, again, ask for everybody's help to Hold the contractors responsible for doing this particular activity correctly in accordance with the law and maybe even in accordance with the way they proposed it to you because they probably told you that they reclaim or they told you that they um, use a certain method and they're not. And I encourage you to go out there and maybe check it yourself every once in a while or have your contractor, if you're hiring a new one, show you what they do during the daytime. Maybe it's not at two o'clock in the morning when they're power washing your streets, but at least 
you can then say, hey, you, sh you gave me a demonstration and you told me that you reclaimed it. And now I have a complaint from the water board of the city that says you aren't using your control methods. Why not? It's a little bit of accountability for them to do it correctly as well. And you touched on my favorite word, accountability. So we'll call it there. And I want to thank everyone for uh, being part of the dialogue today and particularly for your questions. Um, and I want to thank you for just the work you're doing to make our city's um, business districts cleaner. It's not easy to manage public money and it's not easy to work in the public right away. I hear it from uh, many of you often. It's It can be frustrating. It's, it's not easy to manage the map. Uh, this is one of those challenges. It's just one that we face in administering this program together. Uh, but I know many of you, and you don't take on this work day in and day out because it's easy. You do it because you love your community and your city. So we're committed to bringing you more of these opportunities, um, just like this one, to have a dialogue with the right people, to open the lines of communication, uh, and to support all of you, our partners, in addressing these challenges associated with managing our business districts. Um, again, thank you for being here. Thank you to our presenters. Uh, it's, you know, they, you heard from a number of them, but there were many more involved in preparing the materials um, you saw today. Uh, so thank, thank you to all of, all of you. Um, and again, if you want um, to reach out to any of us, you have our contact information. We're happy to help facilitate those conversations, really trying to start um, a, a authentic dialogue on each of these challenges uh, today with stormwater um, and there's going to be more. So thank you all very much. Really appreciate your time. Yes. Thank you all for what you do. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.